everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm Lynn Krasker Schultz, Director of Programming and Community Outreach for the Vilna Show, Boston Center for Jewish Culture. I would like to thank the Falmouth Jewish Congregation and the Worcester Jewish Community Center. The silver lining of this horrible pandemic is that we have been able to partner with organizations in new ways to create wonderful programs, such as the one you're about to experience. You are among over 500 people registered for this program from around the U.S. The Vilna was built in 1919 during the middle of the Spanish flu pandemic. Today, the Vilna focuses on bringing people together to build community and experience Jewish culture through various modalities, art, film, history, literature, cooking, adult learning, and so much more. Think of us as a JCC or a 92nd Street Y located in historic Beacon Hill, a central hub of activity, all while brimming with Jewish history. Please take a moment at the end of tonight's program to fill out our program survey. We will paste it into the chat box in just a moment and again at the end of the event. We appreciate you giving us your thoughts and feedback. Now for some quick housekeeping. In just a moment, I will hand the virtual microphone over to moderator Pamela Rothstein from the Falmouth Jewish Congregation. She will interview Judy Battalion for roughly 35 to 40 minutes, and then Nancy Greenberg from the Worcester Jewish Community Center will facilitate a Q&A with you as the audience. Please type any questions that you have into the Q&A box, not the chat box, so that we know where to find them. We'll paste Judy's bio in the chat in just a moment. And now, without further ado, I hand the virtual mic over to Pamela Rothstein. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here. Judy, we thank you. We're honored by your presence and by the fact that you squeezed us into a very, very busy publicity tour this past week or two. Uh, my name is Pamela Rothstein. I serve as Director of Lifelong Learning at Falmouth Jewish Congregation, a reform uh, synagogue on, in Falmouth on Cape Cod. Let me introduce Judy and then we'll get started. Judy Battalion was born in Montreal where she grew up speaking English, French, Yiddish, and Hebrew, and as she says, trying to stay warm. She studied the history of science at Harvard and then moved to London to pursue a PhD in art history. All the while, she worked as a curator, researcher, editor, lecturer, comic, MC, scriptwriter, dramaturg, performer, actor, producer, translator, muffin server, and as a temp at the temp agency. Eventually, Judy transformed all of these experiences into material and wrote essays and articles for, amongst other places, uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Vogue, Forward, Salon, and the Jerusalem Post. Her stories about family relationships and the generational transmission of trauma, pathological hoarding, and militant minimalism came together in her previous book, White Walls, a memoir about motherhood, daughterhood, and the mess in between. White Walls was optioned by Warner Brothers for whom Judy is currently developing the TV series Cluttered. And all of that happened before she <laughs> wrote this book, which was a long time in the making and uh, we are eager to hear about it. Judy, you congratulations on this um, really uh, magnificent book and magnificent work of storytelling and history telling. You open your book with a very personal story of discovering, of finding by chance while you were researching Hannah Senesch, a small book about women resistors in the ghettos. And you conclude your book with the comment, I knew how hard this project would be emotionally, intellectually, ethically, and politically. Can you tell us about how this book came to be and from your unexpected discovery of that small book to many years later, the publication this past week. I, I will be glad to tell that. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me and for hosting me and for everyone who's joining. Uh, I'm really, really excited to be here this evening. Um, let me tell you the story of this book. This book began 14 years ago. Um, and it began completely by accident. I never intended to write about the Holocaust or the war 
at all. Um, I was living in London at the time and I was, um, I, I was thinking a lot about my Jewish identity. I myself am the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. But I, I was thinking about what I was calling the emotional legacy of the Holocaust, the way that trauma passes through generations. And really in my own life, I was very interested in, in the fact, in how my Holocaust heritage was shaping my perceptions of and reactions to danger. And I was thinking a lot about that and I decided to um, address that by writing, I was doing performing at the time. So by writing a performance piece and I wanted to write about Jewish women who had confronted danger and I wanted it to have a historical kind of backbone. And the first Jewish woman I could think of who had confronted danger was, as you said, Hannah Senesch. She was someone that I had studied in fifth grade um, and for those in, in listening who don't know who Hanna Senesch is, um, she was a young Hungarian Jew before the war. Uh, she was about 20 years old. She moved to what was in Palestine. Um, and, but during World War II, she wanted to fight back. She joined the Allied forces. She became a paratrooper and uh, she went back to fight the Nazis in occupied Europe. And I'd always studied that she, she was caught, but legend had it, she looked her executioners in the eye when they shot her. And I, I had grown up with Hannah Senesch as a symbol of bravery, uh, of, Jewish, of Jewish courage and pride. But in 2007, I, I, I wasn't interested in learning about Hannah Senesch, the symbol, I wanted to understand Hannah Senesch, the person, who, who was she? Who chooses to go back and fight the Nazis? Who volunteers to take on that, that, that exceptional danger? I wanted to understand her psychology. I wanted to understand the personality around that. Um, and so I went to the British Library. I was looking really, I wanted to find a more nuanced biography of her, not just Hannah Senesch, the hero, but I, I was hoping to find someone who had really studied her or written about her in a, in, a, in, a, in a more psychological capacity. And so I looked up Hannah Senesch in the catalog. I ordered whatever they were. There were not very many books about Hannah Senesch at the British Library. I ordered what they had and I just picked up my stack of books. And one of those books, um, I noticed was unusual. It was an old book and it was, it was in a sort of blue fabric uh, cover with gold writing. And it was also in Yiddish. It was called Freuen in die Ghettos, Women in the Ghettos. Um, but as I always say, even more unusual than this book was the fact that I speak Yiddish. So uh, I actually was able to read it. I, I was drawn to this artifact and I start flipping through looking for Hannah Senesch, but I can't find her. She's only in the last few pages. In front of her are dozens of names with pictures and little bios of young Jewish women who had fought the Nazis. And the chapter titles were things like weapons, ammunition, there was even an ode to guns. And this book was just, it was just, I, I was stunned. It was so different in tone and in content from any any Holocaust narrative that I'd heard, any Holocaust narrative I, I, I've grown up with. Um, and that's how it all began. So there was quite a journey between the discovery of that book and the publication of this book. Uh, my understanding is that that was at least a decade in time during which you became a mother um, had many different responsibilities and the undertaking uh, started with just the translation of that book, but entailed many, many aspects of research. Can you address uh, that process and also how um, your role as the granddaughter of survivors, as um, the daughter of, um, you know, that second, third generation, and then as a mother, uh, how did those different roles that you had play into all of the, both the, the practical aspect of the research and the emotional side of writing this uh, story? Okay, it's like, a, lot a, of it's like a 20 part question. So let me get started. And then if I go off in the wrong, the wrong way, you can come in and steer me back in. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna revise my first answer to you. 
um, when you, when you um, originally, you know, I, I, I kind of framed it that I found this book and, and this is how it all started. And it's true. I found this Yiddish book. I thought it was amazing. I, I never, I never put it down since then, but I also knew even at that time, especially in 2007, um, when I was young and single, um, that this was going to be very hard work. This was, as you said, hard intellectually, hard practically. I mean, this requires research in so many languages and all over the world, and, and certainly hard emotionally. Um, really, uh, you know, I knew that to write about the Holocaust, to, to work with testimonies and memoirs was really going to be a very um, uh, challenging project. So having said that, so basically what I'm saying is I was very excited by this material and I knew I had to pursue it, but I also felt reluctant. I also felt nervous. And I, but overall I felt also a, a real sense of duty. I had found this. I knew this was an amazing story and I, I owed it to, to these women to tell it. So circling back to what I hope is answering your questions. I, um, I, I immediately applied for a translation grant to, um, to translate the work, which I was granted, um, thankfully. And um, I went on to, I thought it would take me six months or, or so, and it ended up taking uh, about five years, partially because I was doing many other things, but partially because I, I didn't really have it in me to sit with it all the time. I could only work on this project in drips and drabs um, because it was so difficult. The, these testimonies and they were so fascinating, but also so, so harrowing. Um, and, and then I decided that I was going to publish this as an academic translation, as an annotated translation. Um, and then I decided I was gonna write it as a novel because that would give me a chance to tell the stories, um, but I wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't have to do, I wouldn't owe the, the truth in the same way. Of course I would do research, but it wouldn't. Have. And so I started to do that. And, and finally it was the year 2017 and the women's marches um, had begun. This is 10 years after I found that original Yiddish book. Um, and, and I, 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 something hit me. I was like, wait a minute. I, I think there's a new, almost a new vibe of feminism in the air. People are really interested in women's resistance, in women's fight, in women's fight for, for justice and for freedom. And, um, in, and also in these hidden women's histories. And that's when I happened to mention this to my agent, a literary agent, and she, and she and she was like, wait a minute, Jewish women were carrying guns taped to their torsos and shooting Nazis? Um, and, and I said, yes. And, and she was the one who said, no, Judy, you have to write this as a nonfiction book. Um, you, you, you need to tell this as a true story. And so that's where I, I began. Actually, first I spent six months doing something completely different. Um, but then finally, I settled down and I, I was in a place in my own life where I felt stable and I, and, 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 and finally I started working on it. Um, and then it, it, it came to me all quite quickly um, once, I, once I committed in that way. Great, thank you. So um, you write that you asked yourself uh, and you begin the book with a, a good deal of historical background and just sort of introducing, framing, framing the whole story, which the, the stories are extremely gripping and powerful. And we're going to get to the story of these women. But you do frame it appropriately within the um, controversies of historiography of the Holocaust, uh, the silence of women's voices. And one of the questions you ask, one of the big questions and themes of the book is why were these stories so obscure, even if they were, and I'm a historian, so this is a big theme in history, and you know this, 
even if a story exists and you can find it on the web, you can find it at Yad Vashem, it doesn't mean that it's known in popular culture and it doesn't shape the way we perceive the Holocaust or, you know, the, again, the silenced voices. So your book does a beautiful and exceptional job of bringing these women to life and their stories to life. They were, they existed already in print, let's say on paper, but they weren't alive. So what can you say to us in terms of the, you know, some of the answers to why, before we get into the stories themselves, why were they obscured? That's a great question. And in fact, that became like the sub question of all my research. On the one hand, what, were the, what, was, what was happening with these women and what was the resistance? What is the story? But at the same time, what happened to the story? Why didn't I, from a, a family and community of Holocaust survivors who has you know, degrees in women's history, women's art history, how could I not know this? How could I not know this? Um, and I, I did find many reasons, which I address at the end of the book, and I, I won't get into all of them now because you could tell I can talk a lot. Um, but you know, some of these reasons were political and, and have to do with how the narrative of the Holocaust what was shaped by certain political motivations um, in, in Poland, in Israel. Um, some of this has to do with zeitgeist. And I believe that at different times over the past 70 years, we, we've been interested in different elements of the Holocaust. And we've also been afraid to talk about different elements of the Holocaust. And that has to do with broader cultural trends. Um, and then some of it is, is personal and it has to do with uh, these women not telling their story or else telling it quietly or telling it and putting it away. And for many of these women, they actually did tell their story in the 1940s. That's why this Yiddish book's from 46. There was, the story was out there, but many of them, many of them felt that they weren't believed Many of them felt that they were even accused. They were, there was this kind of, I heard this time and time again, this sense that, that the, the pure souls had perished, but those who had survived did, some, did something. They were conniving, they were collaborators, they slept their way to safety. Um, many of the women I write about also had real, very profound survivor's guilt. And they talk about, I'm thinking of one woman in particular, Hasya Bielika, who, I mean, I know we'll get to the stories, but she, I mean, she, her, besides the fact that her family was brutally murdered, she became a, a courier in Bialystok. She was bringing weapons from, even from anti-Nazi Germans, taking them to the Russian partisans in the forest. She was doing intelligence missions for the Red Army. She was arming a, a ghetto. And yet she felt that compared to her survivor peers who had um, uh, been through Auschwitz or been through camps, she actually hadn't had it that bad. And she, she felt almost like she didn't have a right to tell her story. She hadn't suffered adequately. Um, and, then, and then also there's the fact that many of these women were very young when, when I, I, who I write about women who are very young. When the war was over, they were 20, 22 years old. They had their whole lives ahead of them and they, they had nothing. They had no family, no home, no, no nationality. And they, they, you know, they need like many refugees or in new countries, they, they really needed to start fresh. And because of that too, like even the ones that wrote their story, it was often like they wrote it as, as therapy and, and then they had to move on and create, and they felt a great need to create children and repopulate the Jewish people and create happy, healthy homes for their children. Um, so for all those reasons um, and more that I, that I do discuss in the book, um, th these stories got, got repressed for many decades. Okay. You also spend some appropriately and very well uh, phrased, spend time in the beginning of the book, setting the scene. Um, this is a specific story of Polish women resistors. Uh, the women resistors were in other countries, but this is a very Polish story with very real um, uh, cultural context. So I want to lead you through some of the um, elements of that that you raised that made these, you know, part of that bigger question, what kind of skills 
did these women bring to this job and where did society put them that they were able to do their work? So one of the topics you raise is education. So could you talk about that a little bit about how education shaped who they were and their skills for this work? So one of my favorite discoveries in, in this book was not about the war at all. It was about pre-war Poland. It was about Poland in the 1930s, which is an era that I knew very little about. It, I mean, it had been so eclipsed by what came after, but now learning about it, I mean, it was so, it was so much more progressive to use a, a modern or current term than I ever would have imagined. So in pre-war, in 1930s Poland, uh, education was mandatory for boys, for girls, up to eighth grade, everyone went to school and universities were open to women too. Um, uh, majority of the women in, in Polish universities were Jewish women. Um, often when I was reading about these, these uh, resistance fighters, they would tell stories like, oh, she you know, would shoot Gestapo men in the head and she had a graduate degree in history from Warsaw University. So these women, many of them, not all of them, but many of them were very educated. Um, but I think what, what really made a difference was how youth was organized. And when I say youth, I mean late teenage, early 20s, that kind of college age period. And in Poland, the Jewish youth was organized into youth movements. 100,000 young Polish Jews were part of youth movements. It, it, it was a, a huge a huge element of the social uh, organization of Jewry in Poland. These Jews weren't allowed to join the Polish scouts. So some of this was a reaction to that. But these youth movements were affiliated with different political parties, with different values. Um, and in, in my case, I, I, I'm looking at youth movements that were generally secular and socialist. And some were Zionist, some were Bundist which were Yiddishists who believed in staying in Europe. They didn't want to move to Eretz Israel. Um, but that's um, the youth movements that I focus on in, in this story. But in these youth movements, in particular, the ones in, in, in my story, women were leaders. They, some of them were run on a model where each subgroup had a, man, a male, a dad, and a, and a female, a mother leader. They called it the intimate group model. And the rest of the members were their children. Um, these groups were, they studied women revolutionaries. They were also, they were very focused on collective living, collaboration, pride, strength, um, pride in your heritage, also physical strength, self-sufficiency, agriculture, working the land. Um, so they did study self-defense and women taught self-defense classes as well. Um, and many of the youth in, in this world, they even, they left their parents' home to move in to communes with their youth movements. They were, there were kibbutzim all over Poland. I, I hadn't known that at all. Um, so when you talk about the education that formed them, I, I think it was both their scholastic uh, element, but also the fact that these, these youth movements trained them and they trained them to to, I mean, they were very um, psychoanalytically and psychologically and emotionally oriented as well. They talked a lot about strengths and weaknesses and, and, and co certainly collaboration and collectivity and equality. And I, I think they really prepared them in many ways for doing the type of underground work that they did in the war. I wanna to return to just one more uh, aspect of this before we move on to the individuals. The ability of these women to uh, speak Polish like Poles and to be even more than just the language to behave like Poles was a big part of this, right? Because they were, they were bold. They took, they dove into this work and dove into situations where they had to pass. So what can you say about that? Sure. So Many of the role, I, I write about a, a wide range of roles of women in the resistance uh, in my book. Some of them were running social organizations, soup kitchens, secret schools, writing underground papers. Some of them were guerrilla fighters, flinging Molotov cocktails, blowing up trains, shooting Nazis. But many of them were courier girls. And these were women who worked on the outside. They, um, which means outside the ghettos, Jews 
would be killed for going outside the ghetto. So these women had to pretend to be Catholic. They pretended to be Christian girls. And, um, and, that's, and that's how they became, that's how they did this courier work. It, by courier work, I mean, they connected the ghettos. They brought Jews information. The ghettos had no radios, no newspapers. It was Jewish girls who were often bringing the news, the news of the Nazi genocidal plan. They, when, they, when the underground groups became militias, they were the ones arming them. They were meeting, they were going out of the ghettos and meeting weapons dealers, buying guns, taping them to their torsos, coming back in with bullets, ammunition, explosives. Um, they brought back and forth fake IDs, papers, and also Jews. They, they rescued other Jews and accompanied them, trying to help them find hiding spots or bringing them to the forest. So a lot of this kind of work had to be done on the outside, on the Aryan side. And so these women had to, they had to pass. And it was easier for women to pass. I think this is what you're getting at. I will now circle back to this answer. Um, it was easier for women to pass. First of all, women were not circumcised. So they didn't have a physical marker of Jewishness on their body, um, which was significant. If a man was suspected of being Jewish, he would be held at gunpoint and told to drop his pants. And so women didn't, didn't have that. They didn't have that threat. But more interesting even, no, I, I, is that women, as I was saying in the 1930s, education was mandatory. But many Jewish families sent their sons to Jewish schools, but they sent their daughters to Polish public schools. And this was often to save on tuition. But this ended up being their greatest asset because these women were more acculturated. They were more assimilated. Jewish women were, they, they had Polish Catholic friends. They understood their habits. They understood their demeanors. They understood, look, look at me here. I see myself in the Zoom screen gesticulating. That was considered very Jewish. So one of the women writes about how she had to wear a muff when she went undercover because it, a, a Catholic pole didn't gesticulate like that and she had to really watch it. So they under, you know, you couldn't wear glasses. That was considered Jewish. There were all kinds of, even how many times a week you brushed your teeth. There were different habits around that, but Jewish women had had exposure to Polish customs it, it, from the most domestic and minute ones to things like Catholic prayer. So it was it, they had a much greater awareness of of the of the elements of the perform they they could perform more easily. And most important, in these public schools. Jewish girls learn to speak Polish, and they say this all the time, like a Pole, not with a creaky Yiddish accent. And this was, I mean, hugely important. They, they could speak. So even in the underground, when men had to go outside the ghetto, they always went with a Jewish woman who would do all the talking for him. If they had to buy a train ticket, she would talk. If they had to, any public speech, it was often the, the woman would do that because she spoke the, the better Polish. Thank you. And it is that uh, granular nature of the narrative that you give that makes all the difference. And just coming back to one thing, uh, you courier is the term that has long been used, but I think you appropriately uh, shift that to connector because courier limits the nature or the, the sense of what these women did. And it really was um, quite varied. And, um, and, and it actually speaks to the purpose of what they were doing that you give them that name. So thank you for doing that among many other things. Um, let's get to the women. How many women are we talking about? Um, to be determined. And I, I will tell you why I say that. I, when I first found that Yiddish book, it listed a few dozen women, which I assumed was it. Then I started doing research. And for, uh, what I did is I ended up looking, doing research into every woman in the Yiddish book and seeing what more I could find about her. And turned out many of them, as you said, had left memoirs, had left testimonies in archives, published by small presses. You know what, I never heard of them. But every time I got a testimony, I got an archive, there would there'd be 20 more women mentioned in her story. And then I would find those stories. And then there'd be 20 more women in each of them. And it really ended up mushrooming. Um, so I'm very confident in saying there were hundreds of these women. 
I know that, I mean, I know that statistic is about 3,000 Jewish women joined partisan detachments in the forests. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable saying there were thousands of these women. But even since my work became public a few weeks ago, I've already gotten, I don't even know how many, every day someone is writing to me about their grandmother who was in Warsaw, who they know was part of the underground. She never talked about it. Have I read anything about so-and-so? And someone else's great aunt who was again in the Warsaw underground and she was killed transporting something on a bus. Have I heard this story? And someone else. And so even now the stories are still coming in. Um, so I, I don't know how many women there were, but um, it was definitely in the hundreds, if not thousands of these young women involved in this organized resistance movement. Mm -hmm. yes, and that also speaks to the issue of how history is told is sometimes dependent on the records that are kept. And much of this work was, would not have been recorded in the same way as um, men or you know, people in the camps where records were kept meticulously. The only time I read about a record being kept was in these women were helping, um, they were helping take care as after the ghettos were raised at, in Warsaw, um, Jewish women were largely uh, the couriers, their job now was they were helping Jews who were in hiding and they were walking around Warsaw with bags with money to pay off hiders, to pay, get food, to make sure that the, the hidden Jews were, um, were okay, they would bring them medical help, they would bring them uh, fake um, uh, photographers to, to take pictures of them for fake IDs. They often had to move them from location because it was too suspect or the hider didn't want to do it anymore or, they, or they, it was just a horrible situation. And these, because they were dealing with thousands and thousands of Jews who were in hiding, these, were, they, these organizations helped anywhere from 12 to 20,000 Jews. They needed some kind of records because they, they were giving financial payments. So the only time I saw any record was that they had wrote down the everyone had a code name. So the hider had a code name, the Jew had a code name and the street had a code name. And even the amount of money that was given, it was a percent and that was also coded based on some equation. And this slip of information was written on a piece of paper like this big and it was kept under their watch. So that is about as accurate a record as you can get. I mean, this was an underground. This was, if someone found out you were Jewish, let alone part of a Jewish underground, they, I mean, you'd be tortured and killed. So yes. Yes, and you uh, do not shy away from portraying those incidents of torture and brutality in the book. So um, you frame this book, part of the, the, the power of this book is that you tell the story in particular of one woman, but there are many other lives and many other women whose lives are interwoven. So can you talk to us about your main woman, your main character, and uh, perhaps some of the others and how, and how you made that decision even to, to frame the story that way? Okay, another five part question that I'll, I'll get to in, in some circuitous way that I, my brain has been working today. Um, my main character or a central figure in the book, her name is Rania Kukielka. And she was 15 when the war began. She was, um, she's from the town of Yenstachov. Uh, so it took me about an hour to drive there from Krakow. Um, and uh, her, she was a middle-class family. They were traditional, but also arts and culture. And she ended up escaping when she knew, her family knew they were gonna be killed. She escaped the ghetto. She um, fled through fields. She pretended to be Christian. She got on a train, someone recognized her. She jumped off the train, She the moving train. She found a job working as a housemaid for a part half German family. Um, but she, she ended up falling in with the underground. Um, she, her sister brought her in and she was 18 at the time. And this was in the town of Beijing. And Beijing was trying to arm themselves for some sort of uprising. And again, they needed a girl to go undercover, to go to Warsaw, to do some missions for them. The reason they needed someone is because all the other connectors or couriers had been killed 
and they were not getting information and they, they, they didn't know what to do. Warsaw was kind of the headquarters and, and was supplying them with a lot of information and weapons. So they asked Renya to go. She looked good as they used to call it. She was lighter skinned, lighter hair. Um, so she became a, a, a courier girl or connector um, going back and forth between the Jin and Warsaw, uh, bringing money, false Aryan papers, arranging buses to rescue groups of Jews, um, going to um, weapons dealers in the cemetery, buying guns, taping them to her torso, smuggling explosives um, on trains helping people, taking people out of the ghetto and trying to find them hiding spots in Warsaw. Um, she was also a witness to the Warsaw ghetto uprising, spread information about that. Um, so that that's, she's the main character. And, and then she does, she actually on one of her missions, she uh, gets caught um, and they think she is Polish. They, they don't even, even when she's caught, they don't realize, this happens to many of these women they don't realize she's Jewish. They assume she's part of the Polish resistance and she is taken to a Gestapo political prison and brutally tortured. Um, and she manages to mastermind her way out. But I, I don't wanna tell you how, because for that you have to buy the book. I, I can't give it all away. Um, but you asked, I think you asked why she was my central character and you know, it had to do with when I when I first found that Yiddish book, hers was the testimony that really stuck with me the most. And partially it was because of her writing. Her writing was very narrative. It was detailed. Um, she told the story in a kind of frank, even with a bit of wit, but it, she had a very clear perspective. She had a very clear eye voice, we would call it in, in memoir writing. And I, I, I immediately sensed who she was and, and her story was so, so dramatic and so full of movement. And I think that's also what attracted me to her because she was a Kesha Reed, she was a connector. She was going back and forth, literally jumping off trains. And this type of movement and activity I thought had great narrative momentum. So for all these reasons, she became also also, and this is important, she, some of the um, women were very political. They were socialists, they were, they were, they're Zionists, they were Bundists, they, they, and, and that affected not only the writing, but that's how they were as, as people. And Renya was not, she, she was young when the war began. So she was a bit too, she's a bit young for the youth movements, but she also just wasn't a political oriented person. And in a way I was drawn to that. I felt that that was relatable about her, um, especially today. And, and that made her feel more contemporary to me in a sense. She, she didn't write with, you know, some of their, the other characters, their writing was filled with um, real socialist passion and, and hers wasn't. And, and it was just a story. And, and I think that also made her feel, yeah, relatable to a contemporary audience. Thank you. Mind, being mindful of the time, I'll have one or two final questions and then we'll turn to uh, attendees. So I want to remind you to please send your questions for Judy Battalion via the Q&A, not the chat. Um, and my colleague, Nancy Greenberg, will be leading that uh, part of the conversation. So just one or two more questions. You, I really... Uh, commend you for publishing this book simultaneously with a young readers edition. Very, not a common occurrence, but this is a, a book that is crying out to be read. And as you said, this is a time where we are hopefully open to hearing silenced voices. Can you um, address that for a minute? You know, have that come to be? What are you hoping will come of that? Sure, so this was actually the, my publisher's idea um, and I got a call one day, um, I remember in the morning, like, they'd like to do a young reader's edition. Is that something you'd be interested in working on? And I, I, I said, of course, I can't believe I didn't think of that. I'm not a children's writer, so I didn't, I just didn't think of that. But of course, I mean, what, how did I start this whole session tonight and this whole project? It was Hannah Senish. And I had studied her in fifth grade and she had left an impression on me for my, my 30 years. 
it was such an impressionable, you know, I, I, it was so important that I've learned about her. I, I remembered her that all those years later, and it feels like just the right age to, to share these stories with, to share stories, um, not just of Jewish legacy, or even a female legacy, but of people who fought, who, who you know, against all odds, did nothing, and they went and, and I mean, took on the German army, who they knew they wouldn't topple the Nazis, but that didn't matter. What mattered was their conviction and their passion and their fury and their commitment and, and, and their fight for what was right and for their freedom and for, and for justice in the world. And I, and I mean, I hope that will inspire every young person and older person too. Um, and, and also these women are so, they're young, they're teenagers. So it's, when I, when I speak to middle school and, and high school students, it, it's very moving for me because they often relate to the work. They see it as history, but also they're at, they ask me questions about how they can use this, these stories to help shape their thoughts on their social activism. And, and that's very exciting. Great place to end. So <laughs> I'm gonna turn this over to Nancy and uh, my personal thanks to you as a Jewish educator and historian for really bringing this uh, woman's life and the life of these women to, to our, not only to our attention, but to our, to life. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Nancy Greenberg. I'm the Cultural Arts Director at the Worcester JCC, and the questions are pouring in. <laughs> um, so let me see. Um, let me see where to start. Um, Judy, did you have, this is from Joanne in the audience, did you have the opportunity to interview any of the women who you wrote about or who were part of the resistance? Yeah, that's a great question. And because I put off this project for so many years, by the time I really sat down to write this as a nonfiction book, most of the women had passed. They, 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 they were no longer with us. There are one or two who are still alive. And I did interview one, she, she, she's, she's no longer living now, but a couple of years ago over, over Skype, she was um, in Florida and her, her son helped arrange it. And um, it, it, I mean, she, she was about a hundred years old at the time. So it was, it was difficult for us to have a, a nuanced conversation, but I can tell you all she kept repeating was, you know, that I must pass on the message that we must work towards social harmony and we must be work towards peace and we must think about our happiness and that, that kind of Com despite all they've been through, it was compassion and, and messages of, of empathy and harmony that, that she wanted to pass on. Thank you. Do you, uh, this is from Deborah. Do you have any idea how many of the women connectors survived versus the number who were found and killed? It's a really good question. And, you know, as we were saying, there's very little hard data. There were no files. There were no employment, you know, binders listing these things. Um, my sense is most were killed and um, uh, a, f a few survived. I, I can't give you a percentage, but, you know, I, I did, I, I tried to find as many as I could who did survive. Um, so I don't know, maybe... I, I don't know. I, and as I said, I'm still getting stories coming in. So it's hard for me to say that, but I, I would say the vast majority were killed. Oh, uh, can you talk about the title of the book, The Light of Days? How, why did you end up calling the book? So this is a two-part answer, my specialty. Um, so, so it was very hard to find a title for this book. We went through many, many times, my editor, my agent and I, it, this was not a, an, it, it wasn't one that just popped out at us. And my editor and I started looking at, um, we decided to look at poems and songs from the period. And then it dawned on me that that original Yiddish book that I'd found, it also had included a few poems and songs. So I went back and I found those. And one of them was written by a young Jewish girl 
as part of a ghetto songwriting contest. There were a number of artistic competitions in the ghetto. And this was a song she'd written about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And, um, and this was from her song. And, and, and this was part of a stanza that said, well, right now Warsaw is decimated, but one day, you know, we know Warsaw will once again see the light of days. And she herself was killed, but the, the, um, it felt like a very inspirational, um, hopeful um, lyric. And, and I think that it, it sat well with us. But then there's another reason too. And that is because in many of these memoirs, um, uh, some of the things, so some of them were written much decades after the war testimonies left when these women were older in age, but some of them were from the war. They're from the forties. They're written in hiding. One of them was written in a prison on toilet paper. And um, these women talk so much at the time about craving food. They were very hungry. They talk about craving, um, they're thirsty. They're very thirsty. And the other thing that they're in the underground and many of them spend a lot of time underground, literally. And they talk about, they, they crave the light of day. And that was very moving for me. And again, hopeful in, in a kind of way and just felt like it, uh, you know, made me, made me, I don't know, appreciate my own, what I have in my own life. I, somehow that, that, that moved me. And, and so for both those reasons, there was something about the light of day that felt inspirational and, and right. That's a great title. There's no question. So there have been several questions that, about the Yiddish book. Um, who was the author of that book? Was it published in other languages? And um, how, how did you decide to sort of use that as a springboard? I, I mean, it took you five years to translate it and um, how did it, it, it seemed to have just been the spark. Okay, so I'll explain a bit about the Yiddish book, Freund and the Ghettos. It was published in 1946. It was edited by someone named Leib Spisman, who was also a survivor, um, and he was based in New York. It was published in New York um, on the Lower East Side by the Women's Pioneer Organization, which it has become since then an organization called Naamat, which still exists. Um, and... Um, the book was intended, so the book, I didn't know this until much later. The book is, it's almost like a scrapbook. It's clippings. And that's why it was very hard to translate. There's no context whatsoever. It's like little, I found out later, it's clippings from many um, published works or newspapers and mostly things written in Hebrew in pre-state Israel. And it was, it had ta he had taken obituaries and articles and some published memoir pieces and had edited them, shortened them, exerted them, and then translated them into Yiddish. And the reason he translated them into Yiddish was to tell American Jews in the most widespread way possible about these incredible exploits of young Jewish women in the war, two years earlier, three years earlier. So the Yiddish was originally intended to be a language of popular, you know, it was to be popular so more people could, could read it and understand the story. Of course, as we lost Yiddish, the, the, the Yiddish made, made this book and story so obscure. Um, so I hope that answers some of the questions. Is, is your translation available somewhere? It, it's not. Um, but a lot of people have asked about that. So now I'm like, wonder what I should do with that. I mean, you know, it's, it's a hard book to read for a contemporary audience because there's no context. There's no, um, that's what, and again, that's why it took me so long to translate it too, because it, it just it launches you in to bits and pieces of different articles and newspapers. Um, so I, I don't even know how easy it would be for a, a contemporary audience to read without a lot of background knowledge, but, but I am thinking about what to do with it now because there has been a lot of interest. 
And um, another a question about your children, um, the young readers edition, what age is that appropriate for? Sorry if I didn't mention that. It's intended for ages 10 to 14. Okay, let me see. Um, so what was the biggest surprise in your research? Like what surprise, uh, you've spoken a little bit, but you know, people ask me that and I'm like, every day was a surprise. I mean, these stories were so, uh, they were so different than what I'd ever heard about. You know, I was surprised, but I was surprised by 1930s Poland and this sort of progressive golden cultural era that I knew nothing about. I was surprised by um, the scope of Jewish resistance. You know, I'd heard of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. I had no idea that over 90 European ghettos had armed Jewish underground units. I was surprised that there was resistance, you know, mini uprisings in Sobibor, Treblinka, in Auschwitz. I write about one at Auschwitz in my book. It's a story about 30 Jewish women who get together and steal gunpowder to help blow up a crematorium. And they do it. I'd never heard of any of that. So, you know, every story was so was so amazing. You know, these stories of these courier girls or connectors, Kesheriot, who went undercover, who were passing as 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 Christian. I, I I mean, every one of their tales is so incredible. One of them gets a job accidental. She doesn't even try. They she goes to employment agency for a job. They say, Oh, you're perfect. You'll get it, you'll work for the Gestapo. She becomes a secretary in the Gestapo office. She she ends up you know, bringing them tea and, 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 and bringing them, and they, one of them develops a crush on her. He invites her to a Christmas party. She brings these other girls, Jewish girls who are, because they can't say no, you have to pretend to be playing the part. Other Jewish girls staying with her, all these three girls undercover at a Gestapo Christmas party. Um, these are all girls smuggling weapons across the country. And, the, and there's a photo of them in the book at this Christmas party taken by a Gestapo man. So, you know, each story was just so surprising to me on, on multiple levels. I, I, I simply hadn't heard stories like this. So another question, is your um, book getting any recognition in Poland? I know it just came out two weeks ago or so. Yeah, it's going to be published in Poland next year. Um, I, I've had a Polish publisher for a long time now, and they're very supportive and they're very excited. Um, and it's going to come out in 2022 for the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising anniversary. Um, I had a, an article a few weeks ago in the New York Times um, where I talked a bit about this book, and it, there was response in the Polish press. And they, they, it was incredible. They're very interested in um, how they didn't know about some of these women. And they went in and interviewed Polish historians who also were talking about the same reason, neither political reasons why in, in Poland, some of these women were communists. Now people don't talk about the communists. You know, there, there are many reasons why these stories get silenced. And again, I get into more detail in my book, but, um, and then they're, they're, and then they ended this, this, they're now proposing to make a monument for one of these women. And I mean, it feel, I mean, that's, ne I never went into this looking to make a monument, but um, it actually feels very gratifying. She should have a monument. Um, it's interesting. Some of the women in my story were awarded a military medals from the Polish government after the war. They, the women who had died, they were given these posthumous military recognition and, and yet we've forgotten about them. Wow. So I think the one last question, um, uh, could you tell us about the possible movie by Steven Spielberg? Sure. Um, the, the book was optioned by Steven Spielberg's uh, company, Amblin, um, right, right when I first sold it on a proposal. Um, no pressure. Um, so, um, and they've commissioned a screenplay and, and I am going to be co-writing the screenplay with a screenwriter. Um, but we'll see, you know, fingers crossed. Okay, well, um... There are many, many more questions coming in, but I, I think that that's a 
a good place to sort of close. So uh, let me just say on behalf of the Vilna Falmouth Jewish Congregation and the Worcester JCC that we'd like to extend our congratulations to you on your remarkable book. And um, it is really high time that the heroism and the extraordinary accomplishments of these brave young Jewish women who defied the Nazis and risked their lives in the fight for justice and liberty has come to light. Thank you for sharing some of the stories with us tonight. Um, be sure to order your own copy of Judy Battalion's book, The Light of Days, which is available for online purchase through independent bookstores, eightcousins.com, and they have signed book plates, uh, and tidepoolbookshop.com also. Um, and from bookshop.org and Amazon, of course. And do note that there is a Young Readers edition geared for ages 10 to 14. Please also join us for some upcoming virtual partnership programs. A discussion of Talia Karner's book, The Third Daughter, uh, is this coming evening, uh, this coming Monday, April 26th at 7 p.m. Our next author is Jonathan Kaufman discussing the book, The Last Kings of Shanghai, the rival dynasties that helped create modern China, Thursday, May 6th at 2 p.m. And Mimi LeMay, author of What We Will Become, A Mother, A Son, and a Journey of Transformation, Tuesday, June 1st at 3 p.m. Vilna has already hosted Mimi LeMay, but if you missed that talk, please join the Falmouth Jewish Congregation and the Worcester JCC for this program. Watch your email for details and registration information and there will also be a recorded link of tonight's program. Thank you to my colleagues, Lynn Krasker Schultz of the Vilna and Pamela Rothstein of Falmouth Jewish Congregation. Thank you again, Judy Battalion, so very much. Stay well, everyone. Thank you for joining us and have a good evening. Thank you for having me. Zeigesind.